Welcome back to the Craftsman Online Podcast. This is a weekly program focused on the relevant topics in Freemasonry and the various aspects of the craft. Any opinions, thoughts, or viewpoints shared during this program are that of the individual and do not reflect the official position of any Grand Lodge, appendant, or concordant body from which that member may hail. I'm your host, Brother Michael Arce, and we're back to connect this week on Masonic art. With the dramatic rise of Freemasonry in the 18th century, art played a fundamental role in our practice, the rhetoric, and global dissemination of Freemasonry. And in the modern age, art continues to be a very powerful form of expression. And we're going to bring in our guest for the week, Brother Ari Rosimov. Welcome to the Craftsman Online Podcast, brother. Thank you very much, brother. I'm really glad and I feel very honored that you invited me. Ari is a very accomplished Masonic painter and artist who shares his unique style of art on our website, craftsmanonline.com, through several blog posts, especially our Masonic art section. And I wanted to get to your style of art. I think a lot of Freemasons, when you visit a Masonic lodge, you'll usually see that painting of George Washington or some other famous pictures or illustrations that incorporate our teachings and symbols. And your art is much different than that. It seems more personal. Um, there's more emotion. There's more life. There's more meaning. There's more perspective. And I want to start with a common theme I think everybody takes away from when they see your art is that old Russian folk art feeling. How has that theme inspired you? Where did it come from? Well, in my own background, I'm from Europe, you know, and uh, I have a strong background with Russian, uh, not only Russian, but also Eastern European culture. And I was raised uh, in that spirit with the music, the arts, the folk crafts. And they have been a very um, strong influence on how, I guess, how I see uh, life. Uh, There's a certain innocence to a lot of it, which I like. And also uh, not always innocence. But uh, the influence is always there, and I guess uh, at some point it's also subconscious. So if you see certain elements of that within my uh, Masonic artwork, uh, it's a natural. I don't really uh, think much about it. I think that my paintings are odd. I think that they actually they have me doing what they want. It's the painting that sort of paints itself. And I happen to be the tool that they use. Very often, I don't even know exactly what the painting will look like. It's a very mystical process, really. A little backstory. We had some technical difficulties or challenges for you to you know, get onto the Zoom call. And you were talking about how technology and machines can sometimes be a challenge for you. And I'm like, well, if you put a paintbrush in my hand and I was pointed in front of a, an easel and you know there was canvas there, that would be difficult for me to come up with something. Can you walk me through the inspiration process? How does that work for you? It comes to you. It's subconscious. Everything. I really do believe that everything we do in life, everything we like, for example, what colors we like, what attracts us, it comes from our subconscious. I think this is something that comes from a higher uh, force than ourselves. It comes from God. We're created a certain way. And why does one person prefer uh, this type of furniture over that type of furniture, this type of artwork over that type of artwork? To intellectualize it is it, nice. It sounds good, a lot of words. But how meaningful is that really? I believe that we are created a certain way to be a certain uh, this or that with particular likes. And of course, it can change, it can develop. But I believe that the human uh, condition uh, is uh, one that has a lot more going uh, for it than what is there on the surface. It's a very, very, um, one could also say a spiritual thing. So therefore, therefore, um, it's like the paintings that paint themselves. It's the same thing. We feel things and we see things and we I don't think that rationalizing them is all that possible. Let's go to the beginning of your story as an artist. Um, Masonic art wasn't something that you just woke up one day and started painting. You had quite a career started with the folk art that we see on your website, AriRosimov.com. We'll have the link to that website in the episode bio here. 
But what were some of your early paintings? And walk us through how you started to get that Masonic inspiration and your art started to showcase that. Since I was a child, I started uh, drawing at the age of three. I started painting, uh, actually painting in oils at the age of seven. And I come from a home where, thank God, uh, culture was very appreciated. And I was very uh, lucky to have had parents who really uh, encouraged me to pursue it. Many people are not that lucky to have had that. And the cultural aspects of my home, as I mentioned before, uh, naturally made their way into my art. I live, I live all over. I, I can't connect myself with one physical place, really, because I, I've lived here, I've lived there, I've in Switzerland, I've uh, been always very close to Switzerland. I've been, uh, I've lived in uh, California, New York, uh, San Diego was a city, Miami Beach. But I bring my spirit with me wherever I go. So I bring these influences with me wherever I go. So naturally, when I became uh, a Mason and when I did Masonic work, you will see, maybe you perhaps will see some of that in there. But my work is not all folk art. Folk art has been more an inspiration. I'm not a folk artist in the sense that folk artist is one specific thing. The person who is basically, uh, you know, a, 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 it's, uh, how can I describe? It, it's, it's almost like a peasant in a way. But not really. It's someone who paints because they love to paint, whatever. I'm a very, uh, I, I, my greatest teachers in art have been the masters, the old masters. Uh, I love paintings, uh, the paintings of Rembrandt, of Titian, uh, uh, Tintoretto, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as well as many of the moderns. But um, uh, when I first began painting Masonic subjects, I wasn't all that aware of what Masonic uh, culture or what Freemasonry was, what it was was the symbolism. I was attracted to symbolism because I have a very strong uh, attraction to uh, religious art and spirituality. I mean, if you look at the uh, all-seeing eye of God within the triangle, you'll find that in the Byzantine paintings. You'll find it in some, I believe, also uh, Renaissance paintings. Uh, It's not uh, exclusively Masonic, but it represents something um, solid on a religious level. And that always attracted me. I had heard about Freemasonry over the years. Uh, I've heard the good things. I've heard the bad things. I've heard it all. But the symbols and the imagery is what prompted me to get more and more interested. I would walk through the streets of Los Angeles, for example, or through Amsterdam. I lived for for quite a few years on and off in Amsterdam. And I would look at buildings and I would say, ah, that must be Masonic, that must be Masonic, that must be, that's how it went. Of course, they probably were not. In some cases, there may have been uh, uh, symbols that were used in masonry, but other things that might have been, you know, it, it was all, it was, I didn't know what I was looking at, but in any, in any case, it attracted me. So lo and behold, I first really became involved uh, in reading about Freemasonry in, um, back in Amsterdam. And uh, little by little, I uh, was reading more. I read a lot of negative stuff. I said, could this be true? Of course, it really didn't make any sense. But I eventually started reading really good things, looking at books and the pictures. Always the pictures are what inspired me. The aprons were a great influence me, uh, on me. And in fact, they're a very neglected part of folk art. And the aprons... Uh, actually led me right right in that direction. I started uh, to look for them and the jewelry, you know, the designs, the imagery. And then I had met people. I, we did a film uh, called Freaks and Sense of the Human Side Show, which was about human uh, the, uh, story, uh, history of human oddities throughout the ages, physical human anomalies. Not a, it's not an exploitation film. It was really very well received by, you know, b- critics in uh, Village Voice, New York Times, and Europe. And and uh, we did a lot of interviews there. And I met David Friedman. David F. Friedman was a film producer. He did uh, sort of exploitation films, but he was a very, very, very nice man. And I was at his home. We went there, Vivian and I, and we uh, filmed him, interviewed him, and then we saw these Masonic uh, posters there. And and he was, turns out he was a 32nd degree Scottish Rite 
uh, Mason also. So uh, I was very impressed by him. And so to make a long story short, I was already painting symbols and in some cases things that may have been Masonic. But when I became a Mason, I began to really do Masonic uh, paint, it seems paintings. Brother Ari is a member of Consolidated Lodge number 31 in New York City. And you are one of the brothers that I have gotten to meet, I think, virtually through this pandemic, uh, especially through the work of the Craftsman Online Project. Uh, and I say that because the first time I had heard of you was I was walking through the Robert R. Livingston Library at the New York Grand Lodge, and I saw this spectacular painting of Hiram Abiff. And it was one of those things where, as a Freemason, I looked at it, and you didn't have to tell me who the subject was in that painting. I didn't need the little card, but I read it and I was like, this is a very interesting interpretation of Hiram Abiff. And then I would say years later, uh, I was at a, our friend's house, very worshipful Paul Holsapel in upstate New York. And I saw a print of your artwork there. And I'm like, I know that artist and I know that work. So I want to talk about our friend Hiram because he's featured in some of your paintings Unlike any other way that I've ever seen him, he's never the same. And I'd like for you to talk about that, how you see Hiram Abiff and how his vision is reflected in your art. Okay, Hiram, of course, is fundamental in Freemasonry. And of course, that makes him a metaphor. And he's a metaphor for basically, I mean, he symbolizes basically all the Masonic ideals that there are in masonry. He, he represents also the universality of the Masonic teachings and the Masonic morality. And in a sense, I would say every single Freemason can be Hiram. So when I depict him, I don't want to, uh, well, let me point out two things. I don't want one particular face because he could be anybody. And in that sense, in the dramas, whatever, people portray different uh, people and people and personalities. So in a sense, anyone could be Hiram. There's no, I mean, they paint portraits of people uh, from history. They paint uh, pictures of uh, emperors and religious figures. No one really knows how the, their physical features in any event. So it's really an old tradition. But in Hiram's case, I think it's more important because of the symbolism of him in Freemasonry to paint him different. In that case, I think it's a, a very important thing. And also, uh, very often we'll see depictions of Hiram Abiff, which basically look like wax figures. They're two-dimensional. I want to paint him as a human being, which is even more important than uh, the, the differences in appearance, because he can only mean something if he has a human personality. So Hiram, Hiram could be anyone. I mean, he could be you. He could be your uncle, your uh, cousin, your your son. He could be anyone, and that's how I envision him. And we were talking about uh, you were mentioning the <clears throat> excuse me, Robert uh, R. Livingston uh, Masonic Library and Museum. I would like to mention that previously I had displayed on display there uh, my triptych. I have a very um, Symbolic triptych. It's three paintings which basically show three show depict three aspects in the development of Freemasonry, and they were on display there. The pictures were on display there for eight years. The first panel is called Foundations, and there you see the very beginnings. The story starts from bottom. You move upwards. You see the builders, you see Hiram Abiff standing there with, he's holding out the square and the other hand, he's got the compass. To his right is King David, to his left is uh, the King of Tyr, uh, the second Hiram uh, <clears throat> that confuses historians to this day. And then we move upwards, we have the cathedrals, we have Masonic chivalry, which I uh, show a, um, I, did, I, I show a, a knight in armor, basically. A Masonic knight, and then we move upwards into the modern age, which is the, the cultural uh, aspect of Freemasonry, the arts, the prison. So I included numerous uh, uh, personalities uh, 
and the uh, world of literature and, uh, uh, and philosophy. Also, I have uh, authors uh, like uh, uh, Oscar Wilde, Mark Twain, uh, the Russian poet Pushkin, um, uh, Mozart, composer, and I even uh, included Voltaire. And uh, they represent the, the modern world. Now, the second panel is called Eclipse, which shows a world in darkness. Part of it still survives, but it's a world that is in ruins based upon the misdeeds of people. But within the darkness are those looking for light. So you see within them, there's a, there's a group of people that are facing the light. And there's the square compass. Hiram is standing there. King David is at the altar. And, and that shows the road to the third and last of the paintings, which is called Rebirth. And there I have. Uh, King uh, Solomon's Hiram and King uh, Solomon is holding a, um, he's actually releasing a dove out into the open space, which is, you know, uh, beyond the ruins, beyond the ruins. Because in the other painting I show, in the middle piece, I show ruins as well. So here, uh, he wants to know if everything is clear. And you see people building again, building, 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 building civilization. It's called Parable of Light and Darkness. It's so beautiful to me when you talk about your paintings and your work and the symbolism in Freemasonry. And it's such a joy uh, because seeing it, I see one thing. And it's always interesting to hear the artists and say, well, this is what inspired me. This was the interpretation that I was getting. Is there a particular part of our ritual, uh, maybe part of the Haramic legend itself, that for you you're trying to find a way to bring that to life in your art? The basic metaphor is a kind of a rebirth. God created the world. The world, you know, has gone through many tumultuous periods through the ages. But there's always a chance for a rebirth. It's within the human uh, condition to be able to achieve that. But so many just won't do it and that's the bad part the sad part but when you really want to you can really live a life that is one that's very constructive and helpful not only to yourself and your loved ones but to others as well but uh, unfortunately the bad elements are there and uh, will probably always be there which prevent really i mean you'll never have a utopia but you, it's the, cha changing things for the better starts within yourself, and I think that's in in sort of it's implied within the Hiramic legend. After what what you know what what happened, you know what transpired in the in the story, uh, eventually um, the acacia twig and what that represents, which is also in a number of my paintings. You'll find an acacia. Uh, twig there and uh, not necessarily where you think you'd see it but it's there and I think uh, that the inspiration uh, is definitely there for human betterment for lack of a better word another theme that's quite popular in your paintings is faith and in Freemasonry obviously respect for deity is at our core when you think about your gift, and you, you mentioned this a few moments ago, but I, I want to get to your talents and why you feel that God blessed you with this opportunity to be an artist. I have to tell you, in this case, I think you're asking the wrong uh, entity. <laughs> I'm not the one. That you would have to ask the creator, uh, because only uh, God would know why he, he gave us anything. You know, I wouldn't know. I, I, it's a good question. I wonder myself, why me? But in any case, you know, some people say that uh, becoming an artist is a great gift, but it's also a curse. That's, <laughs> that's a very common saying amongst people. I know one thing, I, I, people are given uh, a role in life. I think a lot of people, doesn't mean they always fulfill it. And very often they go the opposite way, but people are very often uh, doing things they don't even realize that they've been preordained to go that route. The trouble is, and why so much uh, goes wrong in the world, 
is because people who are meant to do one thing are put in positions where they do the exact opposite of what they should be doing. In other words, they're not pursuing that which God gave them initially to be doing in the world. I mean, a writer is meant, an author is meant to be an author. A musician, a composer is meant to be a composer. A composer is not meant to be a scientist and so forth and so on. A person is meant to do right, not to do wrong. But it's just already, we're going into morality there. But that's the whole point. I think everyone should somehow come to grips and it's not easy uh, because people will dissuade you. They will pull you away and you're not always in control. Actually, most of the time people are not in control. And that's a problem. I think the society should really be uh, aware of all the potential gifts that are given by God and you know, to be allowed to go and follow those routes. Because if they don't, they won't be doing the right thing. And that helps no one. Ari, you recently partnered with Craftsman Online to create our Masonic art section. And I want to talk about this special page that we've created to showcase your art and also more of the story behind the paintings for our readers. Recently, you revealed the third version of your piece, Hiram's Apron. And I want to talk about the how that artwork has evolved over the years from the first version we mentioned at the Robert R. Livingston Museum in uh, New York City to what we're seeing now on craftsmanonline.com. I can say that uh, Hiram's apron was my very first painting with a solid Masonic theme. And in it, the, the apron, everything is symbolic there. The, the apron of Hiram is not really the apron that he literally wears. It's the apron he presents to the world. And there you see a building of, of the future of the um, society at large, you know, coming together, people to build the structures, the train, the buildings, and so forth and so on. And in the apron are traditional symbols of Freemasonry. It all comes together. Now, I had sold that. That painting today is in a collection in, in Japan. It, uh, I was asked, commissioned to do another version of that uh, painting. And I did one, which uh, is, uh, uh, Hiram looks completely different. And the first one, by the way, what differentiates the first from the others is the first one I incorporated geometric patterns in the clothing uh, of Hiram to, to, to complement the geometric uh, shapes that you see in the buildings. So in the second version, Hiram is depicted much more realistically. Uh, and that, that uh, particular painting uh, appears on a stamp, postage stamp in, uh, uh, for it was uh, uh, for the country of Benin in Africa to celebrate Freemasonry. Uh, the third one, the third version, I decided to include um, uh, King Solomon because he was instrumental in in what Hiram was doing. He was instrumental in in in, in the entire uh, creation of Freemasonry, according to legend, of course, and uh, because he had the initial vision he had the dream he had the desire and Hiram was sent to him because Hiram had the knowledge the craft the talent the skills and the know-how so Hiram always points to the apron and he's pointing to the apron so that everyone should see and in the back of course everything is being built up in that sense, they're all the same. But in this one, I included King Solomon. And he also appears, King Solomon is in the triptych, and I have included him in, a numer in numerous compositions that I did. How you, and I don't want to say slip in or add in, or I will look at other paintings that you've done, and I will see a Masonic symbol here or there. There'll be a mason on the street corner, or the you know square and compass up in the building, and you can tell that that was a Masonic building. How have you found a way to incorporate Freemasonry and our symbolism into your other artwork? I just feel something in me says to to include this here, include that there. It really, uh, uh, I paint all my pictures that way. I don't, unless I'm commissioned to do something or I uh, 
have something very, very specific in mind, I have a very rough sketch, and then I let the picture build itself. It always, I find, works best that way. And I have, for example, like what you, you're you saying, I did, uh, uh, I did a painting of Las Vegas, and I did a painting of Miami Beach, and a painting of, um, uh, those are my, my American scenes that I've done, and of Atlantic City. And in each one of those, I realize those are places I've been to and I enjoy those are American cities I like very much. And I, uh, I, I included Shriners in there because all three of them coincidentally happened one to have been uh, uh, central locations for Shriner conventions uh, in the old days. And uh, uh, so naturally they fit there, but I automatically put them there and I realized, and then I put in the Atlantic city one, I have a Shriner sitting on the, uh, he's sitting on, um, the, uh, ledge of a, of a fence of a gate there. And he, he's kind of looking sad because he represents the history that was once there and no longer is they, by, by the way, they have a gorgeous Atlantic city is a gorgeous Masonic temple uh, that was sold in the 1930s. It had once been a police station afterwards and they had sold it. And uh, last time I was there, which was a number of years ago, this uh, beautiful building has not, it was for rent and I don't know if it's ever been rented. Gorgeous, you know, huge temple building in the whole block. And, uh, I always go to look at it, as I've always looked in uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, there was a, a Masonic temple, which was a more modern, you know, kind, uh, type of a building. So I always look for, look for them, and I look for the structures. I like the 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 historic structures. I also in Hollywood, my painting of Hollywood, I included the old Masonic temple on Hollywood Boulevard, and in front of it, I have all these movie stars of old, great movie stars of old. And numerous Masons. I have Harold Lloyd, the great Harold Lloyd, I included, one of the greatest uh, comedic stars uh, of the silent era. Uh, and he was very involved in Masonry, and he was the imperial potentate of the Al uh, Malaika uh, Temple in Los Angeles. And I have him wearing the fez, and he was standing next to Buster Keaton, and I have Laurel and Hardy. Uh, 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 Oliver Hardy was a Mason, and uh, numerous others. Uh, and uh, I have the temple there, right in the background. I put them all in front of the uh, famous temple. I did add that the temple itself does not have a square compass. On, it doesn't have it on the front. But I uh, took the liberty, as is my, you know, duty as an artist, and I put the, I included the square compass there. I thought it would really get the point across a little better. One of the things I have to say about your artwork is whether it's the winter scenes that you have with the it's just such a dynamic use of color from the cold white. And you use that so well with the bright colors. All of the people in your art just seem so warm and happy and inviting. And you almost want to jump into it and be a part of this world to see where the joy comes from. Yes, I, I, I've been painting a lot of happier pictures these days, which is kind of odd, but I think I paint them because I need them to lift my own spirits. And I think people need to uh, be lifted up because there's too many really, really uh, troublesome things going on in the world today. So I think, you know, you, 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 if you can put some joy into your life, you can't live to totally uh, surrounded by negativity. You must look for the positive. And when I paint a picture uh, these days, I prefer, I've done, I've tackled very difficult subjects uh, in the past, but now I'm older. I want to see happy things. I like to see the innocence of, of what life should be or what we imagine them to be. And they're realistic in the sense that they're realistic emotionally. Yeah, I like the the older, wiser Ari myself. I do want to talk about your most recent painting that's featured on your website, AriRosamoff.com. And the painting is titled One Last Dance. And as I you know, share it with the audience that's listening now, it is one of those paintings that has the dynamic contrast of color, uh, a very dark background, but the subjects have almost a, a bright shining color to them and what's interesting is the story um it was painted during a very dark time for a lot of us which was during the pandemic and 
in your notes, you mentioned that you were living in complete isolation during the pandemic. And a lot of the symbolism of that work, once you see that, you can see the subconscious that was coming into play. So can you walk us through the One Last Dance painting and kind of to the larger context, you know, how has the time that we're living in right now, the pandemic, how has it affected your form of expression? Well, I have to tell you, that was the only painting that I did that I would say falls into the category of dealing with a troublesome, a troublesome uh, a spirit. It comes as a result of what's going on. And the couple is dancing. Could it be their last dance? It's on a dark, empty street. There's one person with an umbrella, but there's no rain coming down yet. And uh, I think, again, it's a painting I did of my, you know, from my subconscious. Uh, it, uh, I was at that time isolated exclusively by myself. Then later with my better half, she, uh, we're, we're together. We've been together now for most of the time. But at that time, I was by myself. And of course, I was not oblivious to what was going on. Uh, as a painter, I actually am isolated much of the time. I'm not one to run around, you know, and uh, go places, walk around streets and whatnot in any event. But in this case, uh, you could not ignore what was going Everything in our lives had changed. The other pictures of dancers, they're happier. Then I went back, I said, you, you know, I have to really do upbeat paintings. I want to do upbeat paintings because I feel better. I hate hearing about the deaths and the illnesses and the disasters and the, you know, and the diabolical political dealings so, and all of that. I don't care for the, to, to really, you know, I, I don't, it, it's enough I have to hear it. I don't want to bring it into my, into my, into my area of being. So to paint, you know, to paint things that are so removed, the innocence of, of folk life, peasant life in the old country. And, and the Russian or Ukrainian countryside, I find that world a good one to live in. It's very, very constructive and it's very inspirational. This has been the Craftsman Online Podcast. I want to thank my guest this week for coming on, Brother Ari Rosima. Thank you very much, Brother Michael. I really had a great time. If Masonic art is important to you or you'd like to continue to read more about Brother Rosimov, you can visit us online at craftsmanonline.com. A reminder that new episodes of our podcast are available for download every Monday morning. Until next time, let peace and harmony prevail. Mm-hmm.